Thank you so much to the church, uh, to Alliance for Democracy for hosting this event, and mostly for you all for coming out and spending the evening here with us. We've been engaged in a three-year community-based research project into disparities in Multnomah County between communities of color and white communities. And we've found, looking across 27 different systems and institutions, deep and broad racial and ethnic disparities in every system and every institution that we looked at. Most of our research, about 60% is new, hasn't been seen before. Another probably 40% or so is synthesizing existing research into one place. We also did not just disparity research in Multnomah County, but looked at racial and ethnic disparities in Seattle, King County, across the nation, and through time to see what, how Multnomah County fared compared to other jurisdictions. And then at the end, I'll talk about coalition recommendations for how we can achieve racial equity in Multnomah County. Like I said, this has been a three-year project, and it's a real partnership between Portland State University and the Coalition of Communities of Color. The coalition, we are an advocacy organization, not a research organization. But communities of color within the coalition came together and said, we need to sort of empower ourselves around data and research. We need to arm ourselves with community verified data and research so we can use it as an advocacy tool. We didn't know how to talk about data very well, and we wanted to learn how to do that. We got funding from a lot of entities, the city of Portland, Multnomah County, and then primarily private foundations. Northwest Health Foundation funded the bulk of this research work. This is the coalition's mission. It's really about collective action for social change, for addressing very explicitly institutional racism and elimination of racial and ethnic disparities. We're an alliance of culturally specific community-based organizations with representation from six communities of color. So we say that and people are like, what are the other two? Because people think black, Latino, Native American, and Asian and Pacific Islander. The coalition is sort of disaggregated black to be African American and African immigrant and refugee. And then we also have representation from the Slavic community, which is historically counted as Caucasian white, but have a lot of the same outcomes here as communities of color because of the immigration <clears throat> and refugee status of the Slavic community. So here are the key findings of the research. The first is that communities of color in Multnomah County are large, and they're growing, and they're growing quickly. This idea that Portland is all white is not true. And we need to talk about that more and more. I think communities of color know this already, right? But white communities here don't. And the idea that Portland is all white makes it more difficult to have real conversations about race, racism, and white privilege. The second finding is that there were disparities in every system and institution that we looked at. There was no exceptions, and they are severe disparities in every single case. The third point is that when we did the comparison study between Multnomah County and King County, where Seattle is, it's worse here for communities of color than in Seattle. The size of the disparities themselves are bigger here. The fourth is that it's worse here in Multnomah County than it is for communities of color on national averages. The fifth point, these disparities are getting worse through time. So we looked at maybe three or four kind of temporal measurements. And in every case, the disparities are growing. So they're not staying the same, 
and they're not shrinking, but in all the ways that we looked at it, they're getting bigger. And now I'm going to make a point that I'll probably make a couple more times. I realize that this is difficult to listen to, and the numbers I'm going to show you soon are very difficult to look at. And I understand that, and I want to make space for that. And that the coalition really believes that final point, which is we can do better, we should do better, let's do something, right? That we realize things are bad, but it should call us to action, right? We don't want to let the badness prevent us from doing something, okay? But if folks kind of want to talk about that and respond to that as we move through this, please, please feel free. So this is the first point, the size of communities of color in Multnomah County. I apologize, but the bottom of my slides are kind of cut off. But this shows the growth of communities of color. People of color are the green, and white people are the grayish color at the top. Those colors will hold true throughout all of our slides. So green is communities of color in the aggregate, and white is gray. So you can see now in 2010, about 28% of Multnomah County are people of color to the church, uh, to Alliance for Democracy for hosting this event, and mostly for you all for coming out and spending the evening here with us. We've been engaged in a three-year community-based research project into disparities in Multnomah County between communities of color and white communities. And we've found, looking across 27 different systems and institutions, deep and broad racial and ethnic disparities in every system and every institution that we looked at. Most of our research, about 60% is new, hasn't been seen before. Another probably 40% or so is synthesizing existing research into one place. We also did not just disparity research in Multnomah County, but looked at racial and ethnic disparities in Seattle, King County, across the nation, and through time to see what, how Multnomah County fared compared to other jurisdictions. And then at the end, I'll talk about coalition recommendations for how we can achieve racial equity in Multnomah County. Like I said, this has been a three-year project, and it's a real partnership between Portland State University and the Coalition of Communities of Color. The coalition, we are an advocacy organization, not a research organization. But communities of color within the coalition came together and said, we need to sort of empower ourselves around data and research. We need to arm ourselves with community-verified data and research so we can use it as an advocacy tool. We didn't know how to talk about data very well, and we wanted to learn how to do that. We got funding from a lot of entities, the city of Portland, Multnomah County, and then primarily private foundations. Northwest Health Foundation funded the bulk of this research work. This is the coalition's mission. It's really about collective action for social change, for addressing very explicitly institutional racism and elimination of racial and ethnic disparities. We're an alliance of culturally specific community-based organizations with representation from six communities of color. So we say that and people are like, what are the other two? Because people think black, Latino, Native American, and Asian and Pacific Islander. The coalition is sort of disaggregated black to be African American and African immigrant and refugee. And then we also have representation from the Slavic community, which is historically counted as Caucasian white, but have a lot of the same outcomes here as communities of color because of the immigration <clears throat> and refugee status of the Slavic community. So here are the key findings of the research. The first is that communities of color in Multnomah County are large 
and they're growing and they're growing quickly. This idea that Portland is all white is not true. And we need to talk about that more and more. I think communities of color know this already, right? But white communities here don't. And the idea that Portland is all white makes it more difficult to have real conversations about race, racism, and white privilege. The second finding is that there were disparities in every system and institution that we looked at. There was no exceptions, and they are severe disparities in every single case. The third point is that when we did the comparison study between Multnomah County and King County, where Seattle is, it's worse here for communities of color than in Seattle. The size of the disparities themselves are bigger here. The fourth is that it's worse here in Multnomah County than it is for communities of color on national averages. The fifth point, these disparities are getting worse through time. So we looked at maybe three or four kind of temporal measurements. And in every case, the disparities are growing. So they're not staying the same, and they're not shrinking. But in all the ways that we looked at it, they're getting bigger. And now I'm going to make a point that I'll probably make a couple more times. I realize that this is difficult to listen to. And the numbers I'm going to show you soon are very difficult to look at. And I understand that, and I want to make space for that and that the coalition really believes that final point, which is we can do better, we should do better, let's do something, right? That we realize things are bad, but it should call us to action, right? We don't want to let the badness prevent us from doing something, okay? But if folks kind of want to talk about that and respond to that as we move through this, please, please feel free. So this is the first point, the size of communities of color in Multnomah County. I apologize, but the bottom of my slides are kind of cut off. But this shows the growth of communities of color. People of color are the green, and white people are the grayish color at the top. Those colors will hold true throughout all of our slides. So green is communities of color in the aggregate, and white is gray. So you can see now in 2010, about 28% of Multnomah County are people of color. Everybody recognizes, including the US Census Bureau, that that number is an undercount. So it's probably the case that about one in three people in Multnomah County are people of color. And you can kind of look just with your eyes you can see that through time, that distinction between white communities and communities of color is going to shrink and shrink. And one of the reasons for that is that communities of color here are young. They're growing more quickly than white communities. So it's the case now that about 45% of our school-age children are students of color. And the younger you look, you know, children under five, are probably majority kids of color. This is all the race and ethnicity of Multnomah County students, which now is 45% students of color. Portland Public Schools is 50% students of color. So as we have a discussion later and we talk about policy change and we talk about planning, what is the community that we're planning for? It's the people who are our children today, right? And so we are no longer planning for a Portland that is predominantly white. I'm now just going to kind of walk through some of the areas of racial disparities that we looked at. The first is income. So again, the green bars are communities of color, and the white bars or the gray bars possibly purple on that slide. The non-green ones 
um, are white communities. And the bottom are the household configurations. So if you just don't even get too engrossed in the numbers right now and step back and look at the difference between those bar sizes. So on average, communities of color have about half the income of white communities. Individual income is all the way to the right. And the average person of color makes $16,000 a year in Multnomah County. And you know how expensive it is to live here and how much our rent costs. And that's compared to a 33,000 for your average white person. That difference is, you know, a two bedroom apartment for a whole year. The other uh, figure I find very difficult to look at is the retirement income, where the average retired person of color has an income of $15,000 a year. And we know sort of the barriers that elders face to begin with, and to have that type of income in Multnomah County is so distressing. And for particular communities of color, it's even worse. So I think the Latino community retirement number is $8,000 a year, is the average amount that an elder who's Latino has to live on. So this is poverty rates. Low incomes correspond to higher rates of poverty. Again, if you just step back for a minute and look at the size of the disparities themselves, they're massive. We talk a lot in the coalition about child poverty. I think it's an indicator that we all care about, right? And white children under the age of five, sort of the most vulnerable children, have a 12% poverty rate. That's terrible. Okay, there are many countries in Europe that have overall poverty rates that are five, six percent. So 12 percent of white children under five living in poverty is horrendous. Okay, it's 37 percent of children of color under five live in poverty. And again, once we start looking at specific communities of color, the African immigrant and refugee child poverty rate in Portland is 57%. Educational attainment. So the coalition really prioritizes education. I think like a lot of members in our community do. It's not a panacea necessarily, but better educational attainment helps things like poverty rates and income. So again, just initially, the size of the disparities, right? On the left are folks who haven't completed high school. It's about 7% of whites in our community didn't, don't have a high school diploma, compared to almost one in three people of color in our community don't have a high school diploma. If you go all the way to the other side, that's our bachelor's degrees, our master's degrees, the degrees that allow folks to access the high paying, secure employment that we all want for our families with living wage jobs. 7% of people of color have a graduate degree in Multnomah County. This is a breakdown. I don't have a lot of slides in this presentation with specific communities of color. It's generally looking at communities of color in the aggregate because we care so much about education this breaks down by community percentages of those who have not completed high school. So you see in the Latino community, it's 44%. I mean, almost half of our Latino community hasn't been able to access a high school diploma. These are cohort graduation rates. These are interesting and they're kind of a new piece of data that is available. And it looks at not just how many folks graduate from high school, but how many folks who show up, you know, for grade nine graduate four years later with a regular diploma, right? So they don't get pushed out and finish in another way. It's not seven years later. But what we really want with our kids is they start grade nine and they graduate in grade 12. So you can see here, 
these are separate years, so it's getting worse, the cohort graduation rate. It's bad for white students, okay? So 63% of white students who start grade nine graduate in four years with their regular diploma. Six out of 10. That's bad, okay? Really bad, and we all care, we all need to do something about this. But for students of color, it's one in two. I mean, if you're a person of color and you enter high school here, you have a 50% chance of not making it in four years. I think on a very related note about how many students are graduating is what students are disciplined in our school and for what. So this is the over and under representation of discipline. So you see like if people were disciplined in proportion to how many students there were of a particular community, they would all be on that middle axis, right? You couldn't see any colors in either direction. Whites are actually disciplined less than their population size suggests. And then all the ones on the right are rates of sort of over-representation. African-American students, Latino students, and Native American students are so disproportionately disciplined in all of our public schools. And there's actually going to be a new report coming out soon by the Multnomah County Commission on Children and Families that's going to be all about this disproportionate discipline and will actually have data about why the kids are getting disciplined because that matters too. So we can start to see trends. African-American students, it's often subjective sort of reasons related to conduct, you know? Latino students, it's attendance issues. But the better data we have about who and why, we can start to create solutions together to address this problem. Higher education. So we, I think, sometimes gripe on our, on our public schools at a lower level, and they are failing our kids. But higher education is not doing very much better. In fact, these rates are very similar to our K through 12 system. So these are folks who start in an Oregon University system school and finish within six years. OK, yeah, the 57 is Asian. The 54 is Latino, and the 46 is Native American. I apologize for that. And I have cards with me, so um, if there's ways that I can send you this information electronically or in hard copy, if you don't use computers, um, come and find me, and I'd be happy to do that. Education is really important, but we also need to recognize that education is not sufficient by itself to overcome all of the racial and ethnic disparities that we see here. And we just like to kind of remind folks of that. We need to eliminate the racial and ethnic disparities in our education system. But focusing purely on education is not going to be enough. And we know that because you can compare folks with the same educational levels and people of color at the same exact educational level as white people have higher unemployment, higher underemployment, and way lower incomes. So we don't have a lot of good data on this locally, but there's been some national studies done. So this slide is looking at national, but I don't expect it to be different here. In fact, my assumption is that the disparity is worse here than the national averages. And what this does is looks at people with the same educational attainment level and differences in income. All the way on the right, I apologize for my keys, all the way on the right are folks with master's degrees, bachelor's degrees, high school, some high school, no high school, I think. Um, 
And you can just tell, like, the income disparities almost get worse the higher your educational attainment, right? But they're there across the board regardless of your educational attainment. Switching to health, our, res our research report has a whole section on health and talks more about it, this. I only have one slide in this presentation, and it's about health insurance. And health is composed of so much more than health care coverage. But I do think the size of the disparity between people of color and white people who don't have health care coverage is huge, and we need to take note and it's getting worse. So the two gray bars and the two green bars are 2,000 compared to 2009 healthcare coverage. So between 2000 and 2009, 15% of people of color didn't have health insurance in 2000. Now it's 22%. It's getting worse for whites, but not as rapidly, and they still are more covered than people of color. Housing. <laughs> so there is, again, a whole section in our report on housing. I pulled out just kind of a couple things to note here. One is that there's this term, housed precariously, and that means folks who really are at risk of losing their housing because they pay 30% or more of their income on their housing, whether it be rent or mortgage. Way more people of color are housed precariously in Multnomah County and in Portland than white people. Housing's expensive here, and so many white people are also paying 30% or more of their income and it's a very dangerous position to be in. The second point, home ownership, and I have a slide on this in a minute, but home ownership is one of the three sort of wealth generating things that people can do. They can be left a bunch of money from their families, inheritance, they have their incomes, and they have real estate. And that's how we transfer wealth and we build wealth in this country. And people of color are not able to access one of the three key areas, which is home ownership, at nearly the rates of whites. They can't pass that wealth on then to their children and their grandchildren. Part of this is discrimination in lending practices, right? So again, there is data it's in our research report where people of color and white people come in, they have the same income, the same qualifications, but the person of color is denied the loan to buy the house and the white person isn't. And we saw the terrible effects of this lending discrimination during the subprime mortgage ongoing crisis. We don't yet have local foreclosure rates disaggregated by race and ethnicity, but when we do, we expect to see that it's more people of color losing their homes during this housing crisis because of the lending discrimination that require them to have mortgages that are unacceptable, that nobody can afford. These are the home ownership rates. Can you read the... <laughs> um, Far left is white, the next one is people of color, the next one is Latino, then Asian, then Native American, and lastly African American. Yeah. I mean, one thing that's not on here that's in our report is when people of color do own homes here, the value of their homes is so much less than the value of white people's homes. So not only are the home ownership rates so much less, but then when you do access home ownership, the value of your home is quite a bit less. I only have one slide on criminal justice. Um, 
it's not fair to do that. And again, in our, in our research work, there's a lot of information on the criminal justice system, both for adults and for juveniles. This again is one of those disproportionality ones. So if there was no disproportionality between people of color and white, you couldn't see any colors. They'd all be squished together on that one vertical line. Underrepresentation is to the left. So there's actually less Asians, adult Asians incarcerated, as you would think based on the size of the Asian community. And then all of the other communities are overrepresented on the right. I think all you have to do is really look at this from far away and realize that black is so unbelievably disproportionately incarcerated. I mean, you don't see, we don't see doing this research, our researchers don't see doing disparity research percentages like 600% overrepresented. It's so glaring that to not do something about it is offensive. This is one of the only other times that we see such a high disproportionality rate, and it's cut off, but I can talk about it. So children in foster care is a problem, right? And so on average in the United States, there is six, about six children out of every thousand children are in the child welfare system. As you move closer to Portland, it gets worse. So in Oregon overall, about 10 children of every thousand are in child welfare. That's a big jump. I know the numbers seem small, but it's out of a thousand children. So going from six on average across the nation to 10 is huge, okay? And then you get to Multnomah County and it's 15, 15.2. That jump again is huge, okay? Every thousand children in Multnomah County, 15 are taken from their families and their communities and put into the child welfare system. Of those children, specific communities are taken and kept, African Americans and Native Americans. So African Americans here in Multnomah County 32 out of 1,000 African American children are taken from their families and kept in the child welfare system. Native Americans, it's 218 Native American children out of 1,000 Native American children in our community are taken from their families, which is basically one in four Native American children are removed from their homes. It's not even prioritizing this compared to you look at the last slide or any of these other slides, but the magnitude of some of these disparities is mind blowing. And you know it and communities know it and they live it. But we need to start looking at some of these more severe, I don't know what to say, um, and focusing some attention in where the disparities are the greatest. This is new piece of data for us. So since we released our first report, an organization called the Foundation Center released a report called Giving to Communities of Color in Oregon. And it looks at foundation giving, philanthropic giving, and it's the first time we've seen this data for about 30 years. So I'm thrilled that they did the work. And foundation giving, charitable giving, is so important for culturally specific organizations, for communities to do community building, advocacy work, provide culturally specific services to their families. And so overall, it said, they did Oregon-wide. They didn't do Multnomah County, but they, did, they looked at Oregon-wide. And Communities of color were about 20% of Oregon's population and receive like 9.5% of the dollars. And then you break it out by community of color and it's even more sort of disastrous. So Latinos are 11% of the state. They're more now. They were 11% at the time. 
and receive 1.6% of foundation dollars. Asian and Pacific Islanders, 0.1 of 1% of foundation dollars and make up about 5% of our state. Political representation, um, this is really important. And we really don't have in this state very many people of color in elected office. So none of our current city commissioners, one of our current county commissioners, and about 2% of officials across the state. So here's my bright spot, because <laughs> I know it's so terrible. But, um, and we do in our report, you know, we have some more things that we want to call out that communities are doing to increase outcomes for their own communities. This is voter uh, voting in Oregon. So the first bar, again, it's whites on one side and communities of color on the other. 2004, 2006, 2008. So there's still a disparity in people of color coming out to vote compared to whites, but it's going up a lot. And obviously a lot of folks think that having Obama, an African American running in 2008, had a lot to do with mobilizing people of color to come out and vote. And that candidates of color are one of the ways we can increase voter turnout for communities of color. So this is the comparison data. Um, that was kind of the portion of here's some of the overview of the disparities in Multnomah County. Like I said, I know that it's, it's difficult. Um, but I think that there are things that we can do about it. And so we looked at some comparisons to sort of defend our work against some pushback that we figured that we might get. So we thought folks would say, well, okay, there's racial disparities in Portland, but there's racial disparities everywhere, right? Racism exists everywhere, so, you know, it's not worse here. So that's why we looked at the comparisons with King County and with national averages. And then we also expected somebody to say to us, okay, well, there's disparities, but surely it's getting better. Like, surely that's just because historically there was a lot of racism, but things are getting better and people are somehow less racist and we're, we're on the right track. You just need to kind of wait it out, <laughs> you know? So we did, um, we did a temporal type of comparisons. So these are all in the report. I'm going to talk about two national comparisons and a little bit of the generational income comparison. So this is comparison with national averages income. So it's kind of a funny chart to look at, but it looks at income in Multnomah County compared to income nationally, both for people of color and for white people. So if folks here in Multnomah County made the same as national averages, it would be like a zero right on that vertical line. There would be no bars in either direction. What you see instead is that the gray bars for white people, regardless of their family composition, make more money living in Multnomah County than national averages. People of color, regardless of their household composition, make less money here than national averages. So it's sort of doubly bad, right? I mean, it's, it's one thing that you have people of color making less money here than they could access nationally, but it's coupled with this overvaluing of white labor, right? So you're sort of devaluing the labor of people of color and at the same time overvaluing the labor of white people. So you end up with like twice the disparity as it would otherwise be. And some of the numbers are large. I mean. Families of color make about $13,000 less per year than national averages. 
I mean, depending on the size of your apartment, 13,000 becomes close to paying your rent for a year. They're sizable numbers. And the fact that they hold true regardless of how you live, you know, as individuals, as families, with partners, you see the same thing. You have to think that there's a, we are valuing one community's labor over another's in a very purposeful way. So the last comparison I'm going to share with you is generational income. And I have a feeling the folks that are all in the audience probably know about this more than I do or the Alliance for Democracy. But this is a chart of Multnomah, Multnomah County's income over the last generation. So 1979 to 2007. And this is all people, all white people, all people of color, all together. And the deciles, like decile 10 up at the top, those are the richest 10% of Multnomah County. And then the bottom one, which is partly cut off, but you can kind of see its orange line there, that would be decile one, and that's the poorest 10% of Multnomah County. So over the last almost 30 years, who has gotten richer? Yeah, like super the top 10 and then some more, you know, decile 9 and 8. So basically the richest 30% of Multnomah County. And they've gotten a lot richer, right? And then everybody else, almost the bottom 70%, the bottom 60%, have lost income over the last generation. This is that gap between rich and poor that we talk about, right? And that I think folks are increasingly talking about. What the coalition wants to add to that discourse is the highly racialized nature of the growing gap between rich and poor, which is this slide. So again, same exact thing as last time, except we separated out white people in the deciles and people of color. So people of color are green again. All people of color, regardless of their decile, minus some people in decile nine, um, lost income over the last generation. It's still the case that the bottom 50% of, white, of whites, or the poorest 50% of whites also lost income but you see how racialized this growing gap between rich and poor is. And it's an important dynamic, I think, to add to the conversation that isn't always there, is that this gap, even if we say that we're glad that rich people are getting richer, we're only talking about rich white people getting richer. So the rich people of color aren't getting richer. In fact, they're losing income. Does that make sense? It's sort of a strange slide to look at. So, I mean, in summary, you know, the disparities, again, like I said, they are so massive. And I would love for you to read the research report or kind of talk to us about the work that we do. But the overwhelming nature of them is shocking. I mean, that we just can't find any sort of exceptions to the rule or trends that are really going the other way. I think the fact that it's worse here than Seattle, apparently there's been some comparison work done with San Francisco and found the same thing, that it's worse here than national averages. We need to say that, and we need to recognize that maybe there's things happening in other places that are helping that we can learn from and that we can be creative ourselves and respond to these disparities. So we have a whole bunch of recommendations in our research report, but I wanna talk about some of the big kind of recommendation areas. And the first is creating racial equity agendas. And this could be done by government entities or by non-governmental entities. You all are here tonight. You have probably many networks and entities and organizations, churches that you interact with. 
Any entity can create a racial equity agenda. The second point around, it isn't just declaring that I'm pro-racial equity, right? Or that my organization is pro-racial equity, though that's important. But it's resourcing that commitment, putting the money where your values really are. The third is around measuring. So we like hard targets with timelines. So we can measure how we're doing, right? I mean, we, we need to say, we don't just want students of color to graduate more in the future, right? Let's say what it is we want. We want 50% more African-American students to be graduating in two years than are graduating now. I mean, let's hold ourselves accountable and set real measures. And that's really the last point. Accountability structures are so key and they can't just be internal. They need to be internal and external, especially to government or to mainstream institutions. This second set of recommendations is what we call infrastructure reforms. What this is really about, sort of like Commissioner Fritz said and, and Portland Polite, I think that there's been a tendency in Portland to rely on relationships a little too much. Relationships are important without a doubt, and we have some good political leaders, but you can't just rely on the goodwill of certain individuals to really create policy change. We need to entrench that change in the systems and institutions themselves so that when leaders turn over and leaders come and go, those policies are still there. There's four of them that we have here. The first is for the top leadership of any sort of entity, governmental or non, to commit in writing to racial equity. These commitments have shown to be effective. They're a way community holds you accountable when you commit to something, do it in writing and be public about it. The second thing is to adopt culturally appropriate data and research practices, which we never would have known to even recommend a few years ago, but having just gone through this giant research project, it's hard to get data on racial and ethnic disparities. Really hard and really time consuming, and that is unnecessary. We want to know how are African Americans doing? How are Latinos doing? How are Slavic people doing? How are children doing? This data should be out there. It should be developed with communities of color. It should be transparent so we can measure our progress. The third, again, is accountability mechanisms. How do we hold ourselves accountable to the commitments that we make? Because if there is no accountability there, it's not going to happen. And finally, equity-based funding. So for organizations that do contracting, subcontracting, granting, et cetera, how do you allocate your funds? We know from this philanthropy research work that foundations are not adequately resourcing communities of color. So we want to see increased funding for communities of color and not just equal to their population size, but equal to addressing the severe disparities that we know exist. The final area is around changing discourse. And this is not going to happen overnight, and I know that. But I think having these conversations with each other is part of that process. We need to name racism. We need to name white privilege. We need to talk about institutional racism. We need to have the difficult conversations that make people uncomfortable. It is absolutely essential. And we're not very good at it. And we need to get over ourselves. You know, we need to change. I think there are dominant discourses in our nation 
And then there are some that are specific to Portland that we need to start changing and we need to change, we need to start at least now. So nationally, this idea again that we somehow are post-racial or that racism is a thing of the past or that racism exists by individual bad people doing bad things, right? We've all heard those stories. The coalition, we are interested in institutional reform. So we're interested in institutional racism and talking about that and addressing that rather than pointing fingers at bad actors that we identify as being personally racist. Not that we don't all have a responsibility to work on that as well, but our focus is on naming institutional racism and seeking institutional reforms. I think in Portland, there's a couple additional dominant discourses that make it more difficult for this work to move forward. The first is everybody's white, so why does race matter? Right? And this is why we really care as a coalition about talking about how many people of color live here and that half of the children who live here are children of color. So we need to get over that. I think the second problem is Portland is a haven of progressive liberalism and we're not racist here. I hope that our research, the research of the Urban League and others, shows that that's not true, right? That we have so many disparities here that are purely race-based disparities. So it's harmful, I think, to the new discourse we want to create by saying that this is just a progressive, liberal, happy place because the only folks reaping the benefit of that are well-to-do white individuals. Lastly, an organizational ally. So I don't know how many of you are connected with organizations in various ways, but you hear all this and you're like, well, what can I do or what can my organization do? And these are some concrete things that we talk about. So the first is sort of the belief or the willingness that an organization may have to change institutionally to advance racial equity. A lot of organizations don't believe that and they're not prepared to do it. So there really has to be a belief and a willingness to reform. Again, naming race, naming racism, and talking about white privilege is essential for that institutional reform process. Engaging community and decision making. So if you're gonna create a racial equity agenda, if you're gonna provide services for communities of color, you better have communities of color at the table helping you make those decisions. And that doesn't mean one person of color or one black person to represent everybody who's black. Real, authentic, meaningful community engagement and authority in decision making. The third is around data again. I think a lot of folks say they like to make data-driven decisions, but they don't. And so I think the first thing is, yeah, look at the data. Use data as a tool to help you advance what you want to advance. But the second part of that is use accurate data, right? So be truthful about your data. The fourth is that internal work that needs to happen. Whatever organizations or networks or communities that you all engage with, be a champion from within. We need advocates on the outside and on the inside of institutions and organizations to make change. Finally is the commitment. You really need as organizations to commit to doing the work. It's not just vaguely saying, yeah, I'm, I'm pro-racial equity. Show that commitment, take action, do something. And we at the coalition are not into finger pointing 
and we are not into the perfect being the enemy of the good. Try, right? Commit to the ideals of racial equity and take action and measure your action and be courageous enough to say, well, we thought this was gonna work, it didn't, and course correct.